everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Nicholas. I'm going to be sharing with you my love for all things rock and gem as we delve through our topic, which is crystal energy revealed. So to start with, I want to take a look at uh, a few helpful terms. I think it's useful to know exactly what we mean when we say crystal as well as what we might mean if we're talking about rocks and minerals and gems and other things. So, you know, first and foremost, I imagine if I uh, had a room full of people, ask them to close their eyes and picture a crystal, they might, you know, conjure up an image that looks a bit like this quartz that I'm holding here. And that is one kind of crystal. We live in a universe literally filled with them. And a materials science definition of crystals tells us that we have a homogeneous, usually solid substance that has a repeating and symmetrical structure. In short, what we have is something that is the same ingredients all the way through. And the shape or shapes made by those ingredients are consistent. They are synchronized, we might think of. Given enough space, crystals form these regular geometric planes with their faces. They meet at very predictable angles. Uh, We have plenty of examples of crystals that we could probably think of in our everyday life, like quartz. And, uh, like, you know, here on this image, we've got a piece of cerusite, a beautiful lead carbonate mineral. Um, But ice is a crystal. Salt and sugar are both crystalline. The hemoglobin that's in our blood also has two different crystal states, depending on what it's carrying, what it's bonded to. So when we talk about crystals, we're talking about this kind of inner order, this inner coherence that takes place at the most foundational level of their makeup. All right, so let's compare the idea of a crystal to words like mineral, rock, gem, and uh, some of their friends. So, you know, first and foremost, a mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic crystal. So it still has to um, maintain that structural level of order and symmetry. It still has that uh, homogeneous composition made out of the same stuff through and through, but it also has to be made by mother nature, by non-living forces. So if we want to name a few minerals, we might think of things like pyrite and calcite, diamond, topaz, beryl, the the list goes on and on. We have approximately 6,000 named mineral species uh, that have been cataloged so far. Now, a mineraloid, on the other hand, is something that only meets some of those criteria. They might not have a perfectly coherent composition, or maybe their structure isn't quite regular or rhythmic enough, or maybe they're made by organic forces. So obsidian and opal are great examples of mineraloids that lack crystal structure. These are things that are, you know, fairly consistent in what they're made out of, but they just don't have that inner framework or lattice that makes it crystalline. Something like pearl or amber are of organic origin, um, so that also kind of disqualifies them from being minerals. Now, rocks, on the other hand, are what happen when minerals come together. So we consider that an aggregate of one or more minerals. Everything that you see in the picture on this slide is actually a rock in one form or another. Um, They have variable composition, variable texture and appearance. Their structures are somewhat more malleable. Uh, Common rocks we probably know are things like granite and marble and limestone, but there are even some gems that we might know and love that are technically rocks rather than uh, single minerals like lapis lazuli, um, which you'll see on the screen, that beautiful lazure blue color. Now, stone is a really nebulous term. This is one that we kind of get free reign to do and say and use however we like. It's pretty much any substance formed of geologic activity. Oftentimes, different disciplines in the realm of science will use stone to connote something that has been shaped or affected by human hands. Think of standing stone, um, stone tool, gemstone. These are things that you know have a kind of human level of activity. And then gemstone, or even just gem, is any of the above if we use them for ornamental purposes. A single mineral, like uh, quartz, could be cut and faceted, and you add it to a ring, and it's now a gemstone. You could take a beautiful piece of nephrite jade, which is technically a metamorphic rock, and string it up as beads and wear it, and now it's a a gemstone rather than just a rock. Uh, So this is also one that has a pretty variable kind of Um, definition to it. 
And as far as how crystals are formed, we've got three main processes. And this is one of my favorite things to kind of pause and reflect and I'm getting to know a new rock because I think it reveals a little bit about the personality of something's energy. So we've got our igneous rocks. Their constituent minerals are known as primary minerals. Uh, they are formed by the cooling of molten rock and its byproducts. So think of all that uh, liquid magma in and below the Earth's crust. And when that seeps out and begins to cool and harden, we get crystals that form in those extant rocks. Um, so these often represent the root cause of an issue because they're the beginning part of the rock cycle. They're the, the birth of every other kind of rock starts with this. Now, sedimentary rocks occur when other kinds of rocks are weathered, when they are eroded and broken down into smaller bits. That can happen through chemical means, through mechanical means. We transport those little bits, we pile them up, we allow them to kind of congeal or lithify into a new rock, and we end up with a, a sedimentary rock or also what is known as a secondary mineral. These have an intimate relationship with the surface level, with environmental issues because they happen in the environment. They're influenced by and shaped by the world around them. So as a you know, healing ally, we might work with sedimentary rocks if we have oversensitivity to something in our environment, energetically speaking, psychically speaking, socially speaking, that's what they're really great at uh, assisting us with. And then finally, we've got metamorphic rocks. Their constituent minerals are known as tertiary minerals. If we take igneous rock, sedimentary rock, or any other kind of rock for that matter, something in between, um, and we apply heat and or pressure, it is transformed. Its components begin to reorganize themselves. And the end product of that is a metamorphic rock. They are the ultimate allies for all processes of change and transformation. They help us find the inner strength and stamina and wherewithal to see a process of transformation all the way through to the end. And then we want to talk about the actual energy of crystals. We, we have to have a little context. It's helpful to know what energy really is. If we ask a room full of spiritual people, metaphysicians and healers, what, what the word energy means, we probably get a lot of nebulous answers. Um, but the truth is that if we turn to physics to define energy, it's simply regarded as the capacity to do work. It is a quality that we can measure or quantify, and we can transfer it to some sort of object or system to perform that work or achieve that outcome. So all matter is functionally composed of these tiny little units. And the farther we subdivide them, the less they resemble matter and the more they resemble energy. They have this quality that can be transferred. They are, you know, brimming with movement and motion and um they don't always behave like solid things. These not so solid things when they come together also generate these kind of standing fields of energy. So systems that vibrate generate electromagnetic fields. These fields expand infinitely from their point of origin at the speed of light because technically light is one kind of electromagnetism and other kinds of electromagnetism are therefore gonna behave in very similar ways. So all this goes on to say that, you know, most of the world around us, most of the cosmos is just empty space. Even the things that appear really solid, you know, like a, a rock, a mineral, a gem, a book, a table, are really made out of tiny little bits moving through that empty space. And we are interacting with their energy fields all the time. When it feels like we're gripping a solid object, what's really happening is that uh, the little bits of matter that I'm made out of and the little bits of matter that object are made out of are stopping one another from, from mixing, from interpenetrating. We're actually feeling the electromagnetism that is almost like a stopgap between our, our subatomic particles. So we're constantly interacting with, surrounded by, permeated by all these different kinds of um, energy fields. And anyone who's sensitive to energy is going to know that palpable changes can be experienced when there are shifts in the energetic atmosphere around us. One of the important things to know about this is that coherent structures are going to produce coherent fields because all of these energy fields are reflections 
of what those items, those objects of systems are made out of. So crystals being by definition, coherent, solid structures are going to have these really coherent or organized energy fields. And while we're talking about energy, I also want to give us just a, a couple more terms that are really useful. I'm going to talk about frequency and amplitude in particular. We'll cover wavelength as a, a, a kind of tangent to this. So on the screen, when you see that little S-shaped curve, we call that a, a sine curve um, or a sine wave. And that is uh, one way that we map out the, the movement and relationship of energies. So frequency is... Um, denoted by A on the graph. And it is a measurement of the number of times that that sine wave repeats. How many little squiggles are in that S given whatever our unit of measurement is? Usually we use things like the, the measurement hertz, which is the number of cycles per second. We measure brain waves in hertz. We can measure sound in, in hertz and megahertz. Um, but essentially think of frequency like the station on a radio. And in fact, if we go back to the kind of ancient and mystical era when radios really did have knobs that you could turn the dial on, um, that number that you arrive at, that, that number that the station broadcasts at is a reflection of the number of thousands of cycles per second. And it's the actual megahertz of the station. So frequency is the channel. Uh, amplitude, on the other hand, is how far away that sine wave moves from the center. So it's the, the tallness, essentially, of that wave. And it represents the volume, the, the loudness of it. So it's how far from the midline that, that sine wave is going to rise and fall. Because in theory, they're, they're supposed to be symmetrical. Um, now, wavelength is just going to be the, the distance between two equal points, two troughs, two points, two midsections, just so long as they're equivalent. And you're going to see that frequency and wavelength are going to have um, an inverse relationship as the frequency increases, the wavelength is going to decrease. So we're not going to worry too much about what the wavelength is um, for the sake of this conversation. Um, but it's really important to kind of bring us back to a tangible real world analogy. Let's, so let's go back to that radio. The station is our frequency. The volume is the amplitude. And if we want to have the best listening experience, we have to make sure that we adjust both. So often in um, healing spaces, metaphysical spaces, spiritual spaces, we talk a lot about frequency and we neglect amplitude. And it doesn't matter what station you set your radio to if you haven't turned up the volume enough to hear it. And an important thing about crystal energy is that coherent structures and therefore coherent energy fields have a naturally higher amplitude than those systems that are less coherent. So given all of that kind of background information, we can talk about what the essential functions of any given crystal are gonna be. And we can kind of distill everything that crystals do to these six bullet points. They cohere or harmonize energy and information. They amplify, which is actually a side effect of that state of coherence. They reflect and refract, which we see demonstrated in a lot of the relationships that crystals have with light. They can um, both symbolically and literally store energy and information. They transmit and receive like antennas, and they also work to translate or we'll say transduce energy or information from one state to another. So we're going to take a look at each of these in sequence, beginning with coherence. So up on the screen, you're going to see some images of the kind of fundamental units of quartz, and they form these little almost, uh, we'll say pyramidal structures that we call a tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron is a regular platonic solid. It's three, uh, four rather equilateral triangles. Um, so we get room for uh, the silicon and the oxygen to come together. And it produces this beautiful lattice. As more of them come together, like you see in the bottom image, we start to see the symmetry emerge, the coherence of its crystal structure. as a really strong threefold symmetry. And in fact, um, we actually classify the crystal system, the kind of geometric family that quartz belongs to as the trigonal family or the trigonal crystal system, uh, implying that threefold symmetry. 
So we can see coherence in a very visceral way if we have powerful enough magnification. And, and oftentimes when we take a look at a mineral specimen, you know, we can count the number of edges and faces and angles and any piece of quartz that you get from anywhere in the world, barring some variation, because you know, nature is always perfectly imperfect, we're going to find the same kinds of angles and faces. We're going to find the same kinds of general symmetries that are uh, pretty regular. No matter how much other variation we find, there's still this innate order or coherence there. So to define coherence, we could, we could describe it as the quality of forming a unified whole wherein all the components are perfectly synchronized. They are completely aligned or organized or ordered, um, whatever other words are going to help us understand that. The natural order and perfection that we see in crystals, the kind of repeatable angles and faces in a given mineral species, are a representation of or a manifestation of their internal coherence. So in other words, the Outer shapes are a reflection of the internal order that's formed when those molecules come together. So we mentioned that coherent energy fields, because of their higher amplitude, um, are, are going to be a little bit louder than, we'll say, the white noise of the world around us. And crystals kind of leverage this for their ability to harmonize or entrain energy fields that are less coherent. Now, in quartz, we see a good example of this in the polarization of light. So, you know, if we take an optical quartz crystal of, you know, any variety, when light travels through the kind of middle axis in either direction, but essentially through, through the midline, uh, light has both an uh, electric pole and a magnetic pole. So think of it as like a, a north-south pole and an east-west pole on a compass. And those uh, are ordinarily in ambient light, kind of scattered in every direction. But when light moves through a polarizing medium like quartz, all of those little photons, all those little packets of light energy begin to line up. So all of their north and south poles are in the same position. All of their east-west poles are in their same position. And it becomes more organized. So that's one way that we see quartz in particular creating a more coherent end result from an incoherent system, bringing order out of chaos. Um, but this happens on other energetic levels too, and it, it occurs through a process called entrainment. So when we bring two energy fields together, when, when two of these systems that are relatively enharmonic, they're, they're willing and able to sync up with one another, um, start a relationship when they begin to commune, we could say the uh, louder or higher amplitude energy field can entrain, or we'll say model, the uh, state of coherence for the lower volume or lower amplitude field. In other words, if I bring a crystal into my energy field, then it is going to teach my energy field to be more organized. So that is functionally the most important part of what's happening with any kind of crystal energy, any kind of experience with crystal healing or magic or manifestation, it's, it's coming from this place of creating order. Now, a side effect of that is crystals are natural amplifiers. Coherent fields project a naturally louder and clearer message. So crystals are going to be able to amplify energies by bringing um, them into a more coherent state. If we want to use a kind of real world analogy of this, imagine that you walk into a crowded room and everyone in this room is talking, but there's no clear message that you can take away. You can stand next to one group of people and hear their message, but there's no kind of prevailing um, communique that, that kind of cuts through the crowd. Now, if you were to close the door and leave and begin to walk away, within a relatively short distance, all of, all of the sounds, all of the words being communicated just kind of fade into the background. Now that's an incoherent energy state. Now to demonstrate what happens when we work with a crystal, let's imagine that we walk into the room and as we do so, suddenly everyone in that room begins to say exactly the same thing at the same time. We go from incoherence to coherence. We go from chaos to order. And now you get the overall message, the takeaway from that, that room loud and clear. You can close the door and walk away and still hear it 
because a more orderly or organized message is going to project farther. So when people talk about how crystals amplify energies or intentions or ideas or emotions, what they probably are missing is that this is the side effect of taking those energies and ideas and allowing them to be in their most orderly, coherent, or harmonious state. So this is actually the side effect. It's like the free gift of the purchase. It's not what we, um, uh, that's not what crystals are meant to give out to us, but it's what ends up happening uh, no matter what. Now, from there, we can talk about reflecting and refracting. These uh, we see in the relationship that crystals have with light. So reflection happens when incoming light bounces off a surface, it's redirected. Um, whereas refraction takes place when we bend light as it travels, like you would do in a, a lens or a prism. And these can be good examples of the way crystals work metaphorically with our consciousness. Crystals are wonderful tools for accessing higher consciousness because they can reflect those higher states to our conscious mind. They allow us to kind of shift gears to have a, a wider perspective or uh, an unbiased perspective of what those higher states of consciousness look like. Now with refraction, we see the kind of bending of light and that could be um, consolidating light to a single focus, like with a, a lens, like a magnifying glass. If you take that in bright sun, you can get a little pinpoint of light that is powerful enough to start a fire. Um, another way that we see refraction is instead of consolidating it to a single focus, but kind of bending it so much that it breaks open. And we see the component rays, the full spectrum in that light. Uh, crystals work in both of those ways. And symbolically, they redirect and refocus energy. This catalyzes change by improving the quality of our focus, by improving how and where we apply that focus. Um, so we get all of the coherence and amplification, and that goes side by side with this quality of reflection and refraction to make sure that we take that coherent, organized energy, which is now louder, and point it in the right place. Crystals are also important tools for information storage. Now there's this persistent myth that we find in, in spiritual circles that quartz is responsible for the memory in our computers. And this is not the case. We actually use things that don't occur in nature like silicon, not to be confused with silica, uh, which is uh, crystalline we'll say um, to, to actually perform the data storage, but it all kind of hinges upon the structure of crystals. So far, we've talked about the inherent order of all things crystalline, but nature is perfectly imperfect. So there are always going to be these happy little accidents that take place on the internal level, most of which we can't see with the naked eye. And I've got some examples of those on the left-hand side of your screen. And these are what we call lattice defects. So these are imperfections in the crystal lattice and that kind of internal arrangement of molecules. Um, and they're always present. You, you, can't usually see them because they're so tiny, so minuscule. Uh, but these defects create space where electrons, photons, other little packets of energy could be potentially stored. Information therefore is something that can be stored here because information is nothing other than coded energy, energy that is directed towards an outcome. Um, and that too can be stored in crystals. So this energy is set in motion when crystals are exposed to the right energy source. That could be sound, it could be mechanical force, vibration, light, ionization, the breath. Um, we can be talking about the, the gross or measurable energies. We could also be talking about subtle energies. Now this mechanism tells us that crystals are naturally recording little tiny impressions of everything they come in contact with. Whatever energetic atmosphere, uh, piece of quartz or any other crystal is in, it's remembering that. And this is why we cleanse our crystals often. When it comes to transmitting and receiving, we can think of crystals as electromagnetic oscillators. They're like antennas that send and receive, and they are attuned to very precise frequencies, precise ranges of, of energy states of consciousness, different channels on the radio, they're, they're more effective or less effective at receiving. 
Um, so they receive and transmit signals that are enharmonic to their own, meaning that they're of a related wavelength. Crystals are going to vary on exactly what they do, what they're transmitting and receiving power is based on the unique factors in any given mineral species. So composition, structure, formation, habit, the process that brought all those things together. And so far we've been talking about the kind of general properties that all crystals have. Uh, but when we get down to the specifics of why does calcite feel different or perform different duties than hematite or kyanite or quartz, and it's because it's composition, it's internal lattice or structure, its formation process differs. And that's what gives them each their own kind of unique um, personalities, their own unique specialties. But this property of, of oscillation, of transmitting specific things is something we actually do take advantage of in our electronics. Not so much for data storage, but we use crystals um, in timepieces and in other electronics where keeping time is important as little tiny oscillators. So if you take a little sliver of quartz and um, you apply electricity to it, that little sliver of quartz begins to vibrate or wiggle. Uh, so essentially in, in, in old school uh, watch or a clock, if you see the word quartz anywhere on the face or on the back of it, what it means is there's a, a tiny little oscillator, a little wafer thin piece of quartz and all that timepiece is doing is counting the number of oscillations, the number of vibrations or wiggles that piece of quartz is making. And it is therefore transmitting information in that. Um, crystals also work a lot like a fractal antenna, which is what we've got a diagram of here on the screen. So if we transport ourselves to another kind of era of the past when our mobile devices didn't look like this, but they had external antennas on them, um, we, you know, we think about how big and clunky they were initially and how that technology got refined over the years. It got smaller and smaller. Now we can't actually see the antennas. And that's because instead of analog antennas, ones that, you know, are pretty visible, how, however long it is, is, you know, just full of a coil of wire. Instead, we use something called a fractal antenna. So in something about the size of your fingernail, uh, we create this repeating geometric structure. Uh, that has a more or less homogeneous composition. It's made out of the same components through and through, and it repeats in the same lattice configuration. And that sounds a lot like the definition of a crystal. Now, when we build um, fractal antennas, we usually kind of compress it into 2D. Um, and they're the only kinds of antennas that are effective at sending and receiving signals on multiple frequencies simultaneously. That's why our phones do so much more now than you know they did 20 years ago. Um, now imagine all the potential we have in a fractal antenna the size of your fingernail, and then think about a two inch quartz crystal, uh, a big old boulder of your favorite gemstone. It's full of this three dimensional kind of lattice that works a lot like the um, capability of that antenna to send and receive, but all the way through from top to bottom, that crystal is a sort of three-dimensional fractal antenna. And then last but not least, one of the most fascinating things that crystals do is translating energy or information from one state to another. And formally, we call this process transduction. So to transduce is to convert energy from one form to another form. In quartz, there are a couple of really obvious kinds of transduction that take place. One of them is called piezoelectricity. Um, so with, with that word, piezine is the, the Greek root that means to squeeze. Um, so by mechanically deforming or stressing that crystal structure, we are generating an electrical charge. We're converting mechanical force into electrical activity. Um, and that has been presupposed as the kind of mechanism for, for how and why crystals heal. And the, the truth is that no matter how hard we squeeze a quartz crystal, we can't actually generate much of an electrical charge, if any. I think instead this is more metaphorical, but it demonstrates the ability that quartz has to convert one kind of subtle energy, our, our internal dialogue, into another. 
Um, other minerals can be pyroelectric. When exposed to heat, they generate electricity. We have fluorescent minerals, which um, convert invisible ultraviolet light into visible light. Um, these are all examples of transduction that take place. So we, again, use those kind of piezoelectric properties of quartz to measure time by converting the electrical energy into mechanical energy. Um, and that's what makes quartz so useful in our electronics. Translation in terms of the, the subtle, the magical, the mystical, means that crystals can adapt our inner dialogue, our intentions and goals and wishes, hopes and dreams into the language of the universe. Remembering, of course, that they simultaneously make this message more coherent, also that they amplify it and make it louder, that they reflect it to and from us and help redirect our focus to ensure that we're getting that quality of coherence. And they act as transmitters and receivers to send that message out into the universe. So all of these things come together to demonstrate how and why crystals are so effective. Now, so far we've been talking about crystals of this sort, but some of the most important crystals that we're going to interact with are inside us. Many parts of the body are inherently crystalline. We have apatite, which is a calcium phosphate mineral in our teeth and bones. We have hemoglobin in the blood, which has two different crystal forms. There are phospholipids and the cell membranes, which are um, semi-crystalline. DNA has certain crystalline components to it. We've got collagen fibers. We have liquid crystal systems, better known as structured water in every cell, in every part of the body. Um, and the grandfather of modern crystal healing also happens to be the founder of liquid crystal studies. And he coined the term liquid crystal mesophase by observing how water in particular, but also other substances, when in their idealized state, maintain a, a structure that is somewhere between the classical definition of a crystal and that of a liquid. So liquid crystal mesophase, meso means in the middle of, so state between liquidity and crystallinity. Water can be organized in any of the seven crystal systems that we use to, um, we'll say categorize or classify minerals. It can have any of the, the unit cells or any of the lattices that belong to those groups. Structured water is the most bioavailable kind of water. In theory, we're supposed to be made out of that. It's necessary for every biological process that takes place in each and every cell. When we drink water out of the tap or from, you know, prepackaged bottled water, that water generally doesn't have much, if any, structure to it. And we actually expend a certain amount of metabolic energy reintroducing a kind of structure to it. Um, but ideally, um, if we think about how much water we're made out of, we are a liquid crystal system. Lots of us know the metric, the, the kind of pop science uh, fact that we're about 70% water by mass or volume. And it's, it's actually quite variable. In utero, that number approaches you know, 90, 95%. If we are very ill or very old, it tends to be that we have a a lower percentage of water in us. But you know, the truth is that water molecules are extraordinarily tiny. They are very, very small. So to achieve 70% of our total mass being made up of water, we could instead look at how the, the sheer number of water molecules in the body and look at it by molecular count. So if you tally up the total number of molecules in the body, and make a ratio of water molecules to all other molecules because they're so small, approximately 99% or more of all the molecules you're made out of are water molecules. And for your body to be in its optimal state, all of that water needs to be organized in a liquid crystal mesophase. So we are very much living, breathing crystals. Another important takeaway is if we look at the, the two molecules that I've got on the screen here for you to see, we've got water is the smaller uh, molecule on the right and quartz is the larger molecule on the left. These aren't drawn to scale. This is you know, just to make a, a simple analogy. 
Um, but we're going to see that water and quartz have very similar structure. Um, they are both polar molecules, which means they have regions that are more negatively charged and reason, uh, regions that are more positively charged. The, the net result is electromagnetically neutral. Um, but because of that um, polar nature of these molecules, they're very willing to bond to other things, including themselves. That's how uh, water creates the hydrogen bonds that allow it to organize and become this liquid crystal mesophase. Uh, but we consider them enharmonic. In other words, they're like two different octaves of the same note. They already have a profound resonance with one another. And Marcel Vogel, who you know, created the first liquid crystal screens and, and pioneered the study of liquid crystals, um, had a lot of thoughts about the enharmonic nature of water and quartz and, and really demonstrated time and time again that we can use quartz to reinvigorate structureless or bulk water into its crystalline form. Uh, so, you know, one pathway that crystals might be influencing our, our physical makeup is by helping us create the, the state of liquid crystallinity from head to toe. Now, if we take all these ideas what we've learned about energy, about crystals, about coherence, about the kind of fundamental properties that crystals have, we can start to understand how science could be used to create a model for crystal healing. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we have rich and robust peer-reviewed data on this. We sure don't, unfortunately, not yet. Um, but if we use this model, that applies to the measurable bits of our universe, then we can also apply it to the subtle energies, those energies we can't measure yet. So firstly, when we have two of these electromagnetic fields that meet, they will attempt to synchronize through the process of entrainment, which we talked about earlier. So crystals, on account of their coherent energy field, they're gonna have a naturally higher amplitude than the human energy field. If no one has told you this yet, you are not coherent. And that's, that's by nature, by design. Um, your, your liver and your legs are not made out of the same stuff. And at a material level, they're going to generate different electromagnetic signatures. On a subtle level, also different spiritual things are involved in the blueprints of these. So we are made to be in flux. We are made to be a kind of symphony of sounds rather than a, a single coherent note. So our lack of coherence is actually going to respond to the coherence of a crystal. So we become a little bit more organized. Now, we do know that changes in the human energy field uh, measure mood and perception. We know that a more coherent energetic state is a hallmark of health. Uh, science is really mindful about asserting whether or not there's a causal relationship here and what kind of relationship that might be. But particularly if we have heart and brain coherence, if the electromagnetic fields of the heart and the brain are synced up in some way, if they are demonstrating enharmonic frequencies, then we tend to see better mental affect. We have you know, this boost in mood and perception, the way we feel improves. We also know that when our mood changes, when our perception is altered, that begins to affect the physical body in terms of the chemistry and um, the electrical signals that are being sent through. When we shift our mental affect, we change the way we feel. All of the chemical and electrical transmitters that cascade through the body are now producing different messages and now carrying different energy. So changes at the kind of chemical and electrical level will therefore begin to affect virtually every process in the body. So if we step back, we can see that this very subtle kind of energetic relationship that we've got with crystals ultimately works its way down to our physical makeup. And so we get to a, a state where energy transcends pathology. Now, all of that is nice and theoretical, but I wanna give you some kind of practical advice for working with crystals, starting with choosing them, building a collection. And you know, first and foremost, we can talk about size, shape, quality, provenance. These are all things that are gonna affect crystal energy differently. Um, the slide here on the left, you see three different kinds of amethyst from three different parts of the world. 
They are all fundamentally the same. They're alpha silicon dioxide with tiny amounts of iron inside um, that creates the various shades of lavender, purple, and violet that we find in, in any good piece of amethyst. Um, but because their geologic environments were different, because the uh, available ingredients were just a little bit different, we can see quite visibly that they're not the same. And that's going to influence energy. And I'm not going to tell you that objectively one of these is better or more effective than another, but I think a, a safe takeaway is that they're going to have different personalities. They're certainly going to feel different. Um, shape and size are also things that uh, we could discuss. You know, lots of people want to know what does such and such shape do to a crystal. And if a crystal's energetic signature primarily comes from the ingredients it's made out of, its chemical composition, its crystal lattice, the kind of internal arrangement of atoms, ions, and molecules that come together, um, and also the geologic process that brought those ingredients together in that shape. There's no amount of cutting and faceting and grinding and rubbing and polishing and shaping that changes those foundational tenets of crystallinity. So we can't change a crystal's energy by, by cutting and polishing it. We can, however, influence the way it's distributed in our space. You know, a crystal sphere is a very unified kind of shape and it's gonna emanate energy softly in all directions. If we take a look at something like, um, you know, a naturally terminated quartz crystal, like the smoky quartz that keep hanging, uh, lifting up, we can see that it's going to have a kind of directional flow of energy through the tip. It, it concentrates or focuses energy to a very concise point. If I were to take this and have it cut into spheres, it would be the same energy. We're just distributing it differently. I think a good analogy here is it's like listening to the same music on different sound systems. You're not actually changing the music, but you might change what you perceive about it. Then you've got, you know, headphones in versus, you know, fancy surround sound. Provenance. Provenance is something that is kind of tied to a larger conversation that's happening in the crystal world now about sourcing our crystals ethically. Um, you know, in truth, this is full of gray area. It's a hard thing to contemplate, but we often like to think about the kind of spiritual impact that is carried by the tools we work with, by the practice that we engage with, by the life we lead, and that carries over into our crystals. So although there's no satisfying soundbite that I can give you, um, there are certainly bigger movements these days toward trying to source our crystals responsibly, sustainably, and socially conscious ways. And so far, there is no trade organization that applies to the kind of metaphysical world, the, the healy-feely world of crystals. So we don't have definitions on what these terms mean. So anyone can throw them out there. But if we start to ask questions about where things come from, then we can start to get answers about how they're sourced. When we're building a collection, it's also helpful to be aware of the fact that on today's market, there are treated, synthetic, simulated, and even misnamed or misrepresented stones. You can have a, a natural piece of amethyst that is heat treated to turn it a beautiful shade of gold, and now it is sold as citrine. You can have clear quartz that's irradiated, bombarded with gamma radiation to turn it into smoky quartz. You can have lab-grown crystals. You can have simulants, which could be made out of um, synthetic glass or resin or other things that only superficially resemble um, crystals. And we have to remember that if something's made out of glass or resin, it certainly isn't going to do what its natural counterpart will because it's not made out of the same stuff. When it comes to misnaming or misrepresenting stones, there's a really big trend in the market these days um, to raise the perceived value of something by rebranding it. This is done usually with pretty common inexpensive rocks that get um, exciting spiritual sounding names, um, which, which improves the perceived value on the market. So whenever we want to go and find crystals, we want to use a mixture of critical thinking skills. We want to make sure that we do have a, an understanding of what a treated stone is and looks like. Even if we couldn't identify it ourselves, we know to ask the questions. Um, we, we know to think about the kinds of things we're working on in life. 
And therefore we start to look for stones that correspond with them. And you know, all of that left brain stuff is wonderful, but we wanna make sure that we're tempering that with our intuition. The most important thing we can do when we're trying to build a collection is to learn to get quiet. When, when it finally comes time to pick up the right rock, still that mind and just see what reaches out to you. You might be attracted to something for its color, its shape, its luster. It might be the way it feels in your hand. Maybe it's just an inner knowing. This is the rock for me. Um, so always, you know, always trust those impulses that we get because it's far more important than looking up the definition of a crystal in a book. Building that one-on-one -on -one relationship is going to be the best way to find the right partner for your healing journey. And then once we've got some crystals, there are a few foundational practices um, that are helpful to know. So I'm going to talk about some of those. Um, you know, first and foremost, cleansing. We talked earlier about how crystals have memory. They retain an energetic imprint of everything they experience. So therefore, we got to cleanse crystals. And it's not because what they're experiencing is inherently good or bad. Instead, we cleanse them because that energy is not necessarily aligned with our intention, with our goal, with what we're trying to achieve by working with a crystal. So it, it's definitely not a case of good energy versus bad energy, just relevant or irrelevant. And there are so many different ways to cleanse crystals. We can use sunlight and moonlight, water, salt, sound, smoke, breath. We can use other crystals like selenite. We can use vibrational essences or elixirs like flower essences. Um, you can use the power of intention through visualization and prayer. But it is helpful to note that not all of these methods are safe for all crystals. If you have a luscious piece of amethyst and you leave it in a sunny place, to let its energy be cleared, you're also going to lose some of that color saturation. It will be bleached by sunlight over time. If you take a, a delicate mineral and you place it on a, a quartz cluster, amethyst cluster to cleanse and recharge it, you might scratch or damage that more delicate stone. Some things will dissolve or be affected by water. Some can be dehydrated or scratched by salt. So we want to always just kind of make sure that we're picking the right cleansing method that's safe for the stone we're working with. And when in doubt, techniques like smoke and sound, breath, those are going to be safe for all of our crystals. So those are the ones I rely upon the most. Uh, I'd also like to point out it's helpful to cleanse more often than you think you need to. Um, you know, we don't, we don't stop to rationalize how often we wash our hands or um, do laundry, but we, we don't always give the same, we'll say, kindness to our crystals who are doing work constantly in the background and therefore will benefit from regular cleansing. So if it's something you're working with on a daily basis, consider at least a once a week cleanse, if not oftener. My rule of thumb is if I wear it outside of the house, it gets a quick overnight cleanse. And then I do a, a deeper cleanse of my whole home and therefore all the crystals in it once a week or once every other week, depending on the kind of energetic climate. And you get to decide what works for you. There's, there's no hard and fast rule that you have to follow, um, but you can't harm your crystals. You can't affect the outcome by cleansing too often. Now, dedication is uh, another kind of foundational practice, one that's a little less popular these days than it once used to be. But when we first get a new stone, when we you know, bring something into our lives and we're beginning to forge that relationship with it, dedication is the act of um, setting the intention that from the start, this crystal is um, something that you are devoting only the best and highest of yourself to, and it will devote only the best and highest of itself to you. So think of it as dedicating your crystals to be used for the highest good or the, the best outcome for all involved. And some people call that pre-programming. It's just planting a little seed. It's ensuring that you do your best to show up for the crystal so it can show up for you. Uh, following that, we get acquainted with it. There's no simple protocol that you have to follow, but before we rush out and put that crystal to work, we should get to know it. A lot like when we've got new humans who enter our lives. We don't tap a stranger on the shoulder and say, hey, would you like to be my new accountant? No, we, we find someone who's qualified. We pick 
the right person who has the skills required. We ensure that they're going to work best for us by the kind of accounting they do, by the kind of needs that we have in our lives. We set up meetings, we bring documents, we do everything we need to kind of set the stage. And then once that getting to know you phase is done, they're capable of doing this. The other thing that happens with getting acquainted with our crystals by spending time with them in contemplation, meditation, visualization, and that can be really formal or really informal, that's up to you. But the better we know them, the more they know us. This is definitely a two-way kind of street. Now, if I needed help moving my house, let's say I'm moving into a new home, I don't just call my accountant to do that if all we have is a kind of perfunctory um, business relationship, because that's not that person's job. They're, they're not a mover. But let's say my best friend happens to be an accountant. Well, if they're my best friend, they're probably willing to come help me move, no matter what their day job is. So the plus side of getting acquainted with their crystals, of forging a deeper relationship, is that they're willing to work outside their normal wheelhouse for us. And then the last kind of foundational practice is called programming, sometimes called setting your intention or charging your crystals. This is not a substitute for cleansing. The kind of modern dialogue we see happening often conflates charging and cleansing, but they're very different kinds of things. I think of programming as a collaborative effort. It's an invitation to co-create with our crystals. It's not a mandate, you will do this for me. It's saying, hey, here's what I'm working on. I'm visualizing this outcome and I'm extending the invitation to the stone to join me collaboratively in in achieving that outcome. And a side note here, the best programming methods aren't just those that kind of project an energy into the stone and, and that's it, but they're the ones that also program us. So maybe that's reciting an affirmation. Maybe that's just visualizing the intended outcome. Maybe that's breathing in the idea, the feeling, the sense of what that intention is gonna be. So you kind of internalize it in a very visceral way and then exhale that intention into the crystal. Um, any of those would be things that, that program both you and the stone simultaneously. So that's gonna conclude our talk. Um, If anyone's interested in learning more, my contact info is on the screen. You are welcome to reach out. Here's an example of the resources I've got in print on crystals, and I would be happy to support you any way that I can.